Okay, we are now recording. Welcome to the latest in our series of Ursula Meyer Advocacy Training Fund programs. I'm going to stop long enough to leave the slide up so anybody watching the archive version gets a sense of what we're doing here, and we'll jump right into the topic. So expect about 15 or 20 seconds of silence so that you can read this. Okay, if you're watching the archive version and that didn't give you enough time, you can pause and go back to that. And if you've finished reading it, here obviously is our topic, just to remind you that today we are talking about storytelling for library advocates. There are many, many ways we could approach this, but I think that if we're gonna talk about storytelling in general, then why don't we start off with a story that talks about how storytelling works for advocacy. The story I wanna share with you is something that happened 15 or 20 years ago, which tells you this is really a fond memory for me and, and an instrumental one in terms of what I've seen libraries do. When I was at San Francisco Public Library for a good long time as their training director and their director of volunteer services, one of the pleasurable projects that I was called into was one that was done through the Urban Libraries Council. And I'm spacing on the name of the other group just because my mind isn't working right, but it was a dual the IMLS, of course, the Institute for Museum and Library Studies or Services. There was a project going that was geared toward people who were in library school, who were thinking about what they were gonna do when they graduated, and they might be on the fence as to whether they wanted to work in a public, a private, a school library, or somewhere else. The mission here was twofold, to draw people into public libraries, get them thinking about that while they were still in library school. And the other thing was to identify our own staff weaknesses in terms of ethnic representation. And if we could identify students from ethnic groups that were not adequately represented in terms of our own communities, uh, we were to court them and try to bring them in. So lovely project. I really liked it. And I, I think there are models of this still going on. But to get to the gist of this, one of the students that came in was somebody who told me right up front from San Jose State University that she was very much interested in working with kids or in special libraries, but was thinking of school libraries rather than public libraries. And my reaction was great. We're going to enjoy having you with us in this group that's being funded through IMLS and ULC. There were 12 library systems all together. We were one of them. So the first thing I did was match her with somebody who was pretty high up in our children's division in the main library. And to get right to the punchline, somebody early before we started the recording here said, how do you avoid being verbose in your storytelling? We can skip all the details about what I did with this person and say, when she finished the program and she graduated, she applied for work at San Francisco Public. You're all familiar enough with how this works to know that usually you start as a temporary as needed, just filling in. And if you're lucky, you get hired in as a part-time person and then down the road a bit, you get into full-time position. Well, this one was so stunningly great. And the people that were mentoring her were so stunningly great that she had immediately made the decision as a result of the program. She was gonna go into public libraries. She applied for a branch position as the children's librarian and she got it fresh out of library school. If we talk about our roles as advocates, it starts with us thinking about what our libraries need and what our communities need. We look at that and we figure out what resources we have and how we can draw them in. We identify the compelling stories we can tell and we identify the resources that go with those stories. In this case, the resource is clearly the person in the children's library in the main library here in San Francisco who was so passionate about her job that she took somebody who was way over here in terms of saying, I want special libraries or I want K through 12. And immediately just by showing her what was possible and engaging her, moved her into becoming somebody that really benefited San Francisco public and that community for a good long time. And that person has continued to move up as an advocate within libraries themselves. That is what we wanna focus on today. That one story we tell that one moment of engagement that captures somebody so strongly that we're not trying to sell them on our cause. We are seeing ourselves as inviting them to be participants in what we do. So they will join us and their friends will join us and we make the positive transformations in our communities that we wanna make. That's storytelling for library advocates. Now I'm gonna take the slide deck down because we don't need to be looking at slides the whole time we're here. As I've mentioned before we got the recording started, and for those of you watching the archive version, what you can expect here is this is gonna be a session where I'll give some information. I'm gonna have the people in the live session as my co-conspirators. 
bouncing ideas off each other. The second part of this, we'll do a little bit of workshopping so that you'll walk away with a story that you can immediately tell. If you're at home watching the archive version or in your office or somewhere on Mars watching the archive version, feel free to take the workshop time to do your own story and listen to the critiques we do back and forth and bounce that off your own stuff. So we're trying to make this applicable to everybody and I hope the levels of engagement here will be great for you. Let us start with just doing some benchmarking here, priming the pump. I want those of you here in the live version, first of all, if you're comfortable with it, turn on your camera and unmute yourself so that we can really have a conversation here, but that's not a requirement. If for any reason you're more comfortable not having your face showing or not being audible, that's okay. I wanna make sure that we create as much as possible a sense that we're in this space together, working together, and doing something that's gonna be meaningful. Thank you for those of you that are responding to that right away. So here's what you do, either in chat or unmute yourself and say it. Tell me one story that you want to tell to foster positive change within your library uh, and the community that it serves. Again, as you can tell, I'm just reading notes here. And for those of you that worry about storytelling, and always have to look at somebody all the time, if you were face-to-face -face live in a room, you'd be looking down at your notes, doing the same thing here. Let's not worry about that part of it. Let's just converse. So the question on the floor is, one story you want to tell to foster positive change within your library and or the community you serve. Any takers? Diane. Uh, okay, I have a hundred, I have a couple hundred stories, so I'll just pick one. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm an adult literacy coordinator, and so I work with adults who need to improve their reading and writing skills in order to achieve whatever they want in their life. So it's learner-driven learner and goal-centered. So we had one woman come in several years ago, and her goal was to help to become an advocate for her disabled son. And she worked with a tutor specifically on how to communicate in writing and verbally with the school system in order to help her child succeed in school. Over time, she brought her husband in and he joined the program and her goals changed every year. As she met a goal, she would set a new goal and a new goal and a new goal. Both she and her husband ended up getting their citizenship um, her husband lost his job when one of the manufacturing companies closed in our town. So because he had a citizenship, he was accepted into a, a, a trade school and he did really well in that. She ended up getting a job at the school district as a, um, a yard duty, which she loved because she got to play with the kids. And he ended up getting a wonderful job at one of the, um, the local building stores. Then COVID hit, both of them lost their jobs. The schools were closed, she was out of work and she loved that job. So what they did was they started their own new business and he it now employs four people in our town who take packages, pallets from Amazon and deliver them to post offices. And she is his secretary and she does all the billing and she has improved her literacy to the point where she can do all the communications and office work to support him. So that is a story of positive change. Um, starting a new business in our town and employing four other people. That last line, say that again. That is a story of positive change in our community. Um, this couple has started a business and they're employing four other people. It just, we have now, ladies and gentlemen, done a half hour workshop in the first two minutes of this. Thank you, <laughs> Diane, that is a spectacular story. <laughs> As you were, you could see me furiously taking notes, so I didn't miss any of that. What was going through my mind was this is such a fabulous story. When you finished it, I was going to reverse us and say, let's find the gem, the heart of that story, and let's identify that. You did that for us at the very end there. You, with that punchline, you gave us the thing that is the story for advocates that draws people in. If I were telling that story, and I assume you're going to tell the story many, many more times, <laughs> anybody else in this group that has their own variation will do it. Think of how Diane told that story, how we got to the punchline. Now put yourself in front of a potential partner, whether it is a community member who you want to be part of your group, 
or whether it's a city council or board member, county board of supervisors, or state legislator, or even national legislator. And the opening line, which is going to be almost guaranteed to hook them in and say, let me tell you a story about how somebody came into a literacy program at my library. And the result was they got their citizenship, they started a business, and now they employ four people in my community. That's what libraries do. Let me tell you about it. Do you think anybody's going to walk away from a story like that? Are we getting it? Wait, this is stunning even to me. I do these kind of storytelling workshops and other writing workshops on a fairly regular basis. And I've never had such a beautiful story up front that, that could serve as a case study for us. I will, because I'm just that kind of wonky trainer, take you under the hood in terms of learning as we go. Normally somebody would say, that's a great story, let's move on. Let's look at what that did for us. You have to understand that in learning, People generally, from what we see from research, is people will gather two or three main ideas, no matter how long they're with you, half hour, an hour, half a day, or a full day. So as somebody who's doing training or facilitating learning, you want to keep in mind, do not throw 30 or 40 different equally important bullet points at somebody and expect them to remember it. And also when you're presenting, do what I just did, pause and let it sink in. We don't need to be afraid of the silence. That works to our advantage. But to the point, People are only going to remember a few things. And so if up front you can do something that Diane just opened the door to us doing, getting a case study that you will remember long after this session is over, that's one of those three big points we want to have. So what's our takeaway here? The story needs to come down to its essential gem up front that hooks people in and makes them so excited they do not want to leave you. Again, that's storytelling and advocacy. That's storytelling in every other setting. Diane, can't thank you enough. Beth, we may have to give her part of my payment for today's session. She just did a great job here. Notice how she went through that story, not giving us too many extraneous details from the start. You know, she gave us a chronological version of it. And that is certainly one thing that we can do in story time. If the chronology is important and it shows the growth of the story and leads us to a, a successful denouement, then that's a good way to go. But if we can do what we're suggesting here in Diane's presentation, that's the first draft, and that was not what we referred to earlier as the lousy first draft. I'm going to avoid Annie Lamont's real words there for the recording here, but that was not our lousy first draft. That was really a very strong third, fourth, or fifth draft, and all we need to do, from my point of view, is flip that with the punchline up front and then lead us back around. You know this in storytelling. You watch a movie, you watch a TV program. We get into what they call the cold open so often these days. If something happens, you're in the middle of it, you have no idea what's going on, but it is so compelling, you cannot walk away from it. And that's what Diane's given us here. That cold open is these people became citizens and they're running their own business. And somebody goes, I thought libraries were all about books. I thought it was about doing this thing or that thing. I didn't know libraries help people get citizenship. I didn't know that libraries help people to actually start a business and become contributing citizens within that context. And that again is something we wanna keep in mind when we tell our stories. Not to get too wonky here, but when we evaluate training, we often think about, was the session okay? Uh, I'm gonna to try to keep this simple, but there's a guy that I admire a lot, He's no longer with us, mind you, but one of the great people in training, James Kirkpatrick. Kirkpatrick had a, a system of evaluating training that he called the four levels. The first level was, was it okay? It was a stupid thing of, was the room okay? Was the teacher okay? Did the teacher brush his or her teeth? Did they smell okay? <laughs> and we all do that because we have to document it, but it's the least significant part of it. The second level was to get to, did anybody learn anything? And that's, of course, is just a starting point. The third level was, what did they do with it? And the fourth thing, which has always been considered the gold standard in the training circles I travel in, gold standard is, what effect did it have on the community you serve? Diane's story right there takes us to level four immediately. So please do not be befuddled as so many of my training colleagues are saying, oh, level four is so hard to do. You can't document that. It's just impossible. So we shouldn't even try. It is easier than you think. And Diane gave us that example. You know your community, you listen, you do follow up, and then you share those stories because A, it has the effect of showing what libraries do in their communities and B, it encourages others to do the same thing. So we're doing a lot of stuff and it's kind of meandering. Let's bring this back home. Storytelling for advocacy involves being engaging, telling something personal, telling something that is compelling and giving people an invitation to join us to do it too. 
if you incorporate those things into your stories, you're home scot-free and you should see your, your advocacy efforts pay off in concrete, measurable ways sooner than later. Any questions so far from anybody? We could chat while I'm waiting for that to come through. Denise has observed in chat connection. I'm thinking about how libraries continue to change in positive ways to help people change their lives in positive ways. Absolutely. And if we want to have writing prompts, which I think are a great thing to do as we're trying to get our writing chops up, or even for those of us who do it a lot, having a simple question like that off to the side of your computer screen or whatever your writing space is, is a great thing. And I think that Denise just put into chat, I'm thinking about how libraries continue to change in positive ways to help people change their lives should be the essential question we ask when we put out our advocacy stories. What change do we want? How do we propose making that change happen? And why is your participation, you're saying this to your potential partners in this, why is your participation essential? And a secondary question beneath all those is, what would it look like if we don't do that? These create the dramatic impetus for great stories and for great advocacy. And that, again, that story that we just heard is wonderful. Any other comments or questions about it? any observations so far? I'm happy to, Paul, if you wish people would say something out loud. You're Please. doing a great, you're doing a great job in this COVID Zoom life. Um, you made a great comment, which is, I'm sure, something everybody would agree, the knowing your community. And I was just reflecting on how dang hard it is to know our community when there's so many communities within the community and how easy it is to think we know our community, right? So who do we see? We see who we see, but to know your community. So for example, <clears throat> Santa Cruz has a unique situation where it's a really, really expensive place to live because it's a very appealing tourist town. So it's a really expensive place to live. And because it's a tourist town, a lot of people have very low income jobs, right? You know, absolutely food service, the metro buses, uh, construction, things like that. So we are hard pressed between real wealthy and real low income people. And one of the proposals for our fabulous new library is for it to include low income housing. Now you say low income housing to some wealthy people and they're very proud. Look how much we help the needy. You say low income housing to some very wealthy people and they say, I can't believe this is where my money's going. I've worked hard to be able to afford to live here. Um, and if we're a group of friends trying to raise funds, it's like, who's our, who am I speaking to? You know, So it's just a tough thing to know who you're talking to when you're telling your story. <laughs> Thanks. Monica, before you cut off there, sure. what do you do to reach out to your community to better understand the different elements of it? Sure, Robin, do you want to join? We did just sign up for the first time for um, some polling information, right? That's our first. Robin? Yeah, we did um, learn. Our situation is also unique in that the library that we would like to see built it's a new library in downtown Santa Cruz. It's on a different location than the existing one. So the old guard would like to keep it in the old location, but by um, intelligently combining some efforts, getting some affordable housing and the library and some invisible parking into the same building, there's economies of scale and there's shared resources that get us the 21st century library we want rather than, a, you know, trying to renovate a tired building and get something out of it for even close to the same money. So, you know, we've got these sort of multiple messages that we're dealing with here, one of them being housing. And so the polling is looking at it and it's finding out that the housing is an issue, but, you know, we have to kind of, I think, um, separate out the various people there and make sure that we're, we're able to talk to every mindset that is in our community when it comes to the housing and the library part of it. <laughs> and how do we know who's who? <laughs> so many rich things to draw from here. And again, let's not lose sight of the fact that this is all coming back to the story if we tell them how we tell them. If I were mm -hmm. trying to, to workshop this quickly, I would start with the uh, with a rough first draft version of, has it ever occurred to you that libraries and housing people can go hand in hand? That question to the right audience will make them say, 
never thought of that. Where are you going with this? And they're either going to be curious or they're going to be in that group that says, we don't want to see that happen. And then you walk. Then you know, <laughs> then you, you found out. The group that isn't. <laughs> okay. But for the group that is effective, the creative people you want to work with that are looking for innovations and what my colleagues and I call a new and better normal, rather than going back to some normal that wasn't so hot in the first place, this is a compelling question. And it allows you to go into the stories. And so that makes me want to ask you, Robin and Monica, what stories are you hearing now that you're already incorporating into your efforts? The, the, the stories that incorporate affordable housing with the library? Yes. That would be where, yeah, we have some work to do. <laughs> Perfect. Because if you came here and already had the answer to all that, there wouldn't be much point in being in a workshop like this. But there, there's a question for you. And it's not just for Robin and Monica. It's all the rest of you who may be doing your own projects that for you are cutting edge, innovative, and have a community impact that's positive. And at a time when we so desperately need positive, creative solutions rather than divisiveness, we can do this thing through libraries. That bears repeating. We can do this thing. And our stories need to reflect that. We need to be upbeat. We need to be creative. We need to acknowledge that we're going to see some opposition on some of the things we want to do. We need to listen to that opposition and incorporate that too into what we do. Uh, reference to one of the earlier sessions, I think it was last October, November, probably November of 2021, we had Patrick Sweeney from every library, and we're hoping we'll have him again back this year to talk about things. But Patrick deals with many things that are community-based in advocacy, including how do you get the people that are against you, either with you or neutralized to the point where they're not going to hurt your cause. Uh, for those of you watching this recording, if that is of interest to you, go back to the California Library Association YouTube channel, look for the Pat Sweeney uh, video there, and leap through that to get to the points where Patrick and I talk a little bit, but mostly Patrick talks about how you get people that are against you to be less obstructionist and understand your point of view while you are doing exactly the same thing and understand their point of view so you can deal effectively with it. You might be surprised at the opportunity for collaboration that could come out of that. And let me look back to the chat and see what else is coming in. Monica observes, knowing your community is hard, a community is made up of so many communities. In fact, again, that's something that the two of you have just been talking about. We're at a time when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. We'll be doing a whole session on that next month, the second Wednesday of August, with a panel of, of people from Library Land that will be looking at what that means to us in terms of our advocacy. But we know that that is an essential part of being able to tell our stories. Let us identify those different communities. And let us tell the stories that appeal to those communities. You understand that one story is not gonna fit all situations. So you really have to be like a jazz musician, have as many riffs as you can have and be ready to call on the right riff when you identify what's going on. I'm gonna circle back to something I hope is obvious to all of you, but a, a great quick story that I observed when I was a training director and volunteer director for San Francisco Public well over a decade ago. We used to try to do outreach to kids and bring more kids into the library and have strong relationships between the community of children and teens in those communities and the librarians there. It was a study in contrast for me as the volunteer coordinator to go out to some of these places and watch the relationships. There were a couple of branches where there were kids all over the place as soon as school was over. There were other places where it was just dead as a doornail. And it took me not all that long to figure out that the ones that had the children and the teens coming in actively using those library facilities were the ones where the librarians routinely went out to the schools and the community centers and talked about what they were doing and invited the children and the teens into their branches. The ones that were dead as doornails were the ones that thought they got to come to us. It tells you something about storytelling, tells you something about identifying your community, and you're never finished. For those of you that like to finish a chore and go on to the next thing, I got bad news for you. We're never finished. There's always something else we got to learn. And whether it's learning to be a better storyteller, learning to be a community advocate, or anything else that appeals to all of us who are in this conversation together today, that's part of the gig, folks. We know it, we embrace it, and we work with it, and we understand, most importantly of all, we are not alone. Now, it sounds like I, I'm doing a paid shill commercial here, but really, I would be remiss if I didn't say, you need your communities. And obviously, California Library Association is one of those places that gives us a chance to meet. So if in any way you're feeling isolated right now from other storytellers and other advocates, 
understand that this wonderful bequest that allows us to do the Ursula Meyer training series is a way to bring that community together by participating in these monthly meetings, by telling people that the archive recordings are out there so that they can learn from them, by meeting when we go to CLA conferences or ALA conferences or any other regional thing that we go to. The more we communicate, the stronger we are, and the more we understand we're not alone in this, and then we become better, more effective storytellers. So in a commercial, and no, Beth did not put me up to that. I just willingly said that today because I think it's an essential thing for us to remember as part of our storytelling toolkit. Our toolkit includes our colleagues and the workshops we can do like this to bounce off each other and get stronger and stronger. Let me stop again. Questions or comments about what we've just said together? Diane? It looked like um, you had written your story out. Is that true? Yes, I wrote it and um, that was published in the local newspaper oh, during okay. COVID. I was wondering if you were willing to share that somehow. Just, um, I, I, like, I like to have that in front of me, you know, see things. And Diane, if you can easily find a link and put it in the chat. I don't That'd know if really Karen nice. can easily do this, but Karen, if you can grab that when it's in there. And when we do the posting here, if there are notes on the YouTube channel about what came out of that, a link to that story would be a really good thing. Yeah, you know, look at what we're doing here. I didn't come with every resource. I didn't know what the stories were gonna be, but coming together and listening to something like that and having Evelina ask Diane, is there a link to that? Gives us another resource and we can share that out and be stronger as a community of storytellers and a community of advocates, community of librarians and library workers. Thanks, Evelina. You are all just doing such a magnificent job of making this so much better than it could otherwise be. I really appreciate that. And I hope that what you're seeing happen here is what you do at the end of the session back in your own communities. Talk about what you got here. Share the resources. Let other people know. Bring those people in because we get stronger every time we do something like this. Excuse me, I'm getting a little excited here. I suppose I shouldn't be, but just am. Any other comments or reflections on what we've done so far? Okay, so now let's go back to the dreaded slides. Um, what we're gonna do over the next few minutes is go into some things that we've already partially covered just through your own comments, but I wanna make sure it's explicitly clear to you that there are some things that we can be doing that are elements of storytelling that can be incorporated into our work. So I'm gonna go back to showing the screen here as soon as I can get that deck back up here. And it looks like, there it is. Let me put it back into slideshow mode. Sorry, I got so many images and messages on my own screen. If you're seeing that bouncing arrow, it's just because I've got a bunch of stuff I'm dealing with and you may not be seeing that. And so the arrow kind of makes it look dizzy. But let's jump past the first couple of slides here. Now let's talk about a few tips here. Storytelling number one, uh, tip number one. You already have heard from what other people have said in this particular conversation that it's gotta be meaningful, it's gotta be engaging to people. I think there's a tendency when we're trying to tell stories to try to figure out what that one little gem is that draws people in. And sometimes we can focus so much on a detail that the overall picture is lost. So one of the challenges we face is finding the detail that's compelling, but putting it within its own context. So a quick question to you. You're looking at this image that I've got here on the screen. Can anybody tell what that image is? And I need to bring up my chat so I can see if anybody actually responds that way. Mosaic, stained glass or mosaic? It's a mosaic, that's great. And so the real loaded question here is, do we have enough of the mosaic there to be able to tell what the whole picture is? Yeah. Right, and that's sometimes what we do in storytelling. We get so much into one little detail there that the whole picture is not obvious until we move on to, and my slides are not advancing, there we go. If we step back, oh, there we don't go. <laughs> Let's try that again. the joys of working online. And I think what's happening here is my own chat screen is interfering with the advance. There we go. All right, so we're looking at that little thing on the left side. And now when we pull back and we see what the detail is, it's a wonderful piece here in San Francisco out near the ocean. If you're really curious about it, it's out at Terraville on the Great Highway done by a local artist, uh, Colette Crutcher. I think this is called Surf Henge. So she's done a Stonehenge surfboard kind of thing with the mosaics there. Look how much different 
differently we react to that. When we first see that beautiful little detail and go, wow, that's stunning, but we don't know what that is. When we pull back and we see that it's this playful thing out by the beach where everything kind of fits together, our stories have to do that. They have to be beautiful. They have to be graceful. They have to be compelling. And I'm gonna go back and make a point that I didn't make when I was showing you the initial title screen. Another mosaic, this one's by Aileen Barr. You're gonna hear a lot as we look at the slides about Colette and Aileen's artwork here in San Francisco. They're mosaic tile workers that are just spectacular. This particular image is on a streetcar stop, again, out in that same basic neighborhood out in the terrible area. The reason I wanted to show this is because I, I was struck when I first saw this about a year or two ago when the installation was completed of how that bird in flight is so graceful. And storytelling is the same way. Storytelling is like that bird in flight. It's graceful, it's beautiful, it's fleeting. It's there and then it's not. But if it's effective, it stays with us as I hope that image will stay with you. And as we look at this surfboard by Colette, we're str struck by the same thing. It's beautiful, it's graceful. It makes us want to know more. It makes us want to luxuriate in that. As we move back to Colette's work in a different setting, this is actually with Colette and Aileen together. They've done a series of mosaic tiled steps throughout San Francisco. This is the latest one. It's out near a school called Mira Loma School. And I found the first time I saw this about six months ago that it did everything that I want a story to do. It drew me in immediately through its beauty, through its color, through kind of the imagination in there. And it made me want to walk up those steps, just like a good story should make us want to walk further into that story with the storyteller until we get to the conclusion of it. So if we're starting to talk about the idea of making things compelling and making them engaging to people, making them meaningful, we can think of these images and say, our stories have to be as compelling and as beautiful as the images we're seeing here. And I'm sorry, I'm just, my chat function here is interfering with my ability to move the slides forward. So I'm having slight delays there. And now we seem to have completely frozen if this continues. Oh, there we go, good. So same staircase, the Miraloma staircase. We get a close up here. That idea that it was wanting us to step into it, it's making us inviting. We look closer at the details. If you've got a large enough screen, you can see that not only is there a nice detail of that, but there's some writing that's been inscribed in there. And if you're looking right in the middle of it in kind of the goldy orange part, you can barely make out the words change the world. It's the end of a quote from Nelson Mandela, whose name is also on there. And if we go one more into that, there's a close up of it, the change the world Nelson Mandela thing. So we've gone from the idea of making it inviting and in that same image, making it actionable. Let's review those tips again with the images up there and then I'll tell you why I'm doing it this way. Make it meaningful, making it compelling, making it inviting and making it actionable. I was very deliberate in looking for images that were similar. They're all mosaic tiled installations here in San Francisco. And the thinking behind this is something I learned from a great colleague in Florida about training. It goes with storytelling as well as with training, that it's one thing to just put a bunch of bullet points up on a screen, or it's another thing to just give a lecture on something, making some big points. But if you can combine your visuals and your text without just repeating things, you're creating what this wonderful colleague, Aaron Blumberg, called anchor um, memory anchors. You'll find, as you think back on today's session, if you're trying to remember what was there, you might as easily recall that there were some mosaic images as there were tips. And if you start to concentrate on what those mosaics were, you might think back to the one about Nelson Mandela change the world and say, oh yeah, one of the tips was make it actionable. That is the invitation in the story to do something, to join me, to go out and make a change that I want and you want and benefits the community in concrete ways. So our stories can benefit in the same way. If you're in a setting where you're just sitting across a room from people face to face on site, your whole story is going to be you, your body language, the intonations of your voice, the way you pause occasionally to make a point. And you do that very judiciously. You rehearse this until it becomes natural so that you're not just reciting it off the top of your head or as so many of us do when we make the mistake of saying, okay, I've got a script, so let me make this point. Sometimes we give far too much detail up front. I oh forget that. It's got to be real and lively. You got to be able to do it off the top of your head. And even if you're reading it, make yourself conscious of the fact you have to read it as you would say it. Sometimes we give far too much detail up front. That's what you want to get through your storytelling, whether you're using notes or whether you're saying it from the heart. 
But those are the first four points. And so we're going to get into another discussion. I'll leave this up just long enough for you to absorb the question that I'm going to bring us back full face to each other. What do you currently do to make your stories meaningful and compelling to your current and potential partners and supporters? You leave it up there for about 10 or 15 seconds so you absorb it. And I'll take the slide down. We'll go back to talking. And a tip for any of you that want to be able to do this kind of thing if you're not already doing it. Uh, the background of how I do this is I've got my deck. I go through that deck many, many times. I print it out. I've actually got the speaker notes in front of me so that if something goes wrong on the screen, I've got those things here. And then it frees me up to do what I'm about to do now, take that slide off, but at the same time, still know that I've got my deck here with that question that's up there. So if anybody two minutes from now says, what was the question? I can just look back at my notes and, and respond to that. Let me see what's coming in on chat. Denise says, I'm thinking we can begin to use our, great. So this is the answer to the question from Denise. I'm thinking we can begin to use our friend's newsletter more effectively to tell and retell more stories, to capture and share and archive them. Again, some quick tips off the top of my head. Going in terms of a slide deck, maybe you want to tell your story with slides and you want to do what I did, find some compelling images that are fun, but don't just mimic what's being said. Have your speaker notes, not bullet points on the screen, but speaker notes that say what you intended to say. You deliver that live as a story, then you post it on whatever site you have and you call people's attention to it so they can look back later and actually read the notes and see the slides if they weren't there to hear your, your presentation. You can do what we do here at CLA, which is actually record the thing and archive it later. So if that story once told has multiple entry points and you don't have to tell that story 50,000 times. You're kind of telling it 10 or 20,000 times. So this is much more manageable and much more agreeable. I'm sure we all agree. Denise, anything you want to add to that in terms of the newsletter, even just based on what I've said, how might you use that newsletter to replicate that story numerous times in numerous venues? I think just to bring more life to it and to do as you're saying and to engage people instead of an informational sort of thing, what we need and uh, as opposed to what we need you to do, you know, here's a story to think about something that that did um, that did have a positive effect. And because of, you know, you, your our members involvement, this story can be told, maybe. Yeah. And never forget, I'll say this over and over again until the cows come home or we end the recording. Always end it with that call to action. This is what we're doing. Please join us. What can we do to engage you? But just give them an action to be taken next. We oftentimes make that call for action, then we don't do the follow up and guilty as charged. I often want to do far more than I make the time to do, but this is where the rubber hits the road. You tell the story, you make the invitation, and then you look around and see who was really excited. And you do the follow up one on one with them to say, what would it take to get you involved? Or what did you like about that? Anybody else? What do you currently do to make your stories meaningful and compelling to your current and potential partners and supporters? Well, tonight I'm going out to talk to a veterans group. And um, what I'm going to be doing now is re-looking at my slide deck and really focusing on what I want them to, I want them to know how wonderful we are, but really what I need to focus on is what, how wonderful we are specifically for their needs. And let's take that one step further. I've done a lot of workshops with library directors encouraging them to build collaborations, not by going out and saying how wonderful we are, but going out and saying, what do you need? Yeah. What's your pain point? I have a great consultant friend, Sardik Love out of Washington, DC, and I admire the heck out of Sardik because he's just so right on so many times. His thing, consultant to consultant, is always ask a potential uh, client, what hurts? What's your pain point? And I think it carries over nicely into advocacy work. When you're going out to that community like you're about to go tonight, what hurts for you? What do you need to do? And look for the area that hurts for you too and say, well, well that hurts for us too. Maybe we can work on this. Right. That is the old Huck Finn thing of, hey, help me paint the fence. We're going to have fun here. Mm -hmm. It is not manipulative. It's offering opportunities. If you think that that's manipulative, we need to work ourselves past that and say, we are all about doing things in our communities that give them opportunities and give us opportunities to create positive change. Going back to the chat here, I see uh, Monica saying 100% follow up fast if there's an ask, right? And Deborah Doyle, who's one of our great advocates, she's involved in the CLA 
Legislation and Advocacy Committee. She's been on the board there. She is very active in ALA. If you don't know Deborah, you need to know her and you ought to chat her up during the chat here to get to know her a little better. But she's making the point, listening is so important. Anybody else? What else are you doing out there to make your stories compelling? One of the things that, um, hi, one I of the know. things that we've been doing is uh, I'm part of the Library Foundation and we are an advocacy group going out. And as I spoke at the last one, which is uh, getting folks to, how can we support you? And what is it you need? And so we're going to every city council in our, um, Stans in Stanislaus County, okay? So I, we're, I'm headed out to a small um, little city within our county. But what we've done that I took from your last, uh, you know, workshop too, with what's going on here is about the listening, interviewing the librarian. We talk to some of the people, so the friends group. So when we go to this city council in Patterson, I'm going to start off with, these are the things we've heard that are so great. These are the things we know you have going on. Patterson, congratulations. You now have a, a garden that you are partnering with the, uh, your garden club here in your city. Uh, we also know that you are lacking in um, having a, you know, staffing right now. And we are all doing everything we can to help support the uh, business of getting more folks to help you out. So personalizing where we are going to the city and city councils to how they can taking from the general into the specific because uh and i changed that whole approach because you guys you know i we were starting out well here's all the things that are wonderful about what the libraries do but how to make it relevant to the audience that we are really talking to which in each case is a different set. It's a different city, like someone was saying about your community. So you got to know your communities, and they're all different. And then um, try to address and hook them in, but also still getting the general message across, which is we're here to support all the libraries and all the great things they do. So um, it, it's helped to listen to the last two uh, workshops, putting them together, and I really have appreciated the information. Thanks so much, Pat. Let's bounce it back to Kathy because there's one other opportunity here for all of us. Kathy, what have you done uh, in terms of researching your audience for tonight to get to know them better before you walk into that room? Well, they're veterans and um, knowing how hard it is for veterans, my, my own family, my, my uh, 24 year service nephew um, passed due to COVID this year. And finding out how hard it is to get benefits, and we're still working on it, for his surviving children. And so that's been real firsthand information. You know, Nick, helping my family Nick, get through to FEMA to help with burial, to get survivor's benefits, those sorts of things. So that's been from my own personal experience. And condolences up front of your loss. Really sorry to hear about that. So we've got that. Uh, something I always have to remind myself of because I bounce around with people that I, I do one or two things with and then move on to the next client sometimes. You know, look at, I don't know if you did this, but have you looked at the veterans website for the yes. group you're going to? And you've seen yes. anything has been written about them lately in the local media or online? Not, not a lot. They're, they're trying to do a lot of reviving. And um, this is actually our, my second attempt to talk to them. The first attempt, they forgot I was coming, had a water leak and didn't let me know. Oh. And several others showed up and it's like, there's, well, I guess it's not a meeting tonight, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and as a, my father was retired military, my ex-husband, we were still married when he hit 20, you know? So I've, I've kind of lived that life as a spouse and as a child. And so my own life experience has helped. That's wonderful. And then again, it's the point, one of many points that I try to make during these things is the more we know our audiences, the better off we are, the more we speak from the heart, the better off we are. We can be personal if it's appropriate in those cases. And we have to know when to filter those things out because sometimes that can bounce back on us in very 
painful ways, as I find that over and over again, when I sometimes get a little too flip in a presentation and somebody takes what I've said in a way that I didn't intend it, then there's two lessons to be learned. A, that's a sensitive issue, and B, uh, there are so many different ways to interpret something. The great thing I learned from a, a workshop storytelling uh, mentor that I had years ago was readers bring about 50% of the story of your story to the story itself. So you can only control that narrative so far. You have to be aware of that and work with it when it comes through. See, Robin's got a comment in here about personalizing the message and all that in all the ways, lots of opportunity. I totally agree with that. Let's go through a couple more tips here and then take a breather so that it can get up and stretch and then we'll come back and we'll do the workshop. But first, let's get to the last couple of points I want to make so that cohesively you're left with an idea of, all right, here are some things I can work with. Can it just take me a second to get down to the slides I want to take us to? Uh, the lovely one that came up in some of the conversation pre-session here making it brief. This is the hardest thing in the world. We have so much to say. I'm quoting a great colleague, Pete Bromberg here, who did a presentation on presentations 10 years ago. He was talking about how you've got to make it brief and Pete in a way that only Pete could say it is, but it's all so good and we want to say all of it, but it's so good and we have to cut it down. So brevity is really good. You do yourself a favor, you do your audience a favor, and it really does force you. I may have said this before we started the recording, forces you to find that one sentence. Oh, we did this during the, the initial workshopping. Find that one sentence that is the grabber, the thing that is universal to your audience, get that up front and then back into the story. So let me be brief about making it brief. And finally, inspirational advocacy is all about inspiring positive. I think it's about inspiring positive action. There are a lot of activists that are doing things that we might not think are so positive. We have to acknowledge that too. But library land, we're trying to make our communities better. We're trying to make things work for the people that we are empathetic toward and that are struggling with things that we know we can somehow assist them with and they can assist us. So we wanna be inspirational, just as these works of art are that we've been talking about here. One thing that I think is really helpful as we kind of wrap this part of here's some tips and tricks to do before we start workshopping is to really show that when I'm telling you to make things personal, I do the same thing in my work. You've seen all these slides so far of these shots of mosaics all over San Francisco. Let me see, I think I've got an image here that this is, maybe I have not included that there, but there is a, a, another mosaic staircase that is about four houses away from where I live. I love that thing. I walk up and down it every day. It's 148 steps. Colette and, Kate and Aileen were the two artists who did it. They did their initial one in my neighborhood that's four blocks away in 2005. And many of us in the neighborhood didn't even know that project was underway until it was finished. And like the five-year-olds we are, we'd walk by that ceramic tile staircase. It was just so gorgeous. Say, we want one of those close to us too. And about five years after that thing was finished, I happened to be of all places in one of the branch libraries here in San Francisco. It was a reopening of the branch. I knew the staff very well because I'd been out there as their volunteer director many times. And they asked the million dollar question when I got there, would you like to meet a local artist? And not knowing what I was getting myself into, I said, sure. And the first artist and the only artist I met because it didn't go any further than that was Colette Crutcher herself. It became clear to me within the first 30 seconds of my having met Colette that this was the person who was one of two artists who did that staircase four, four blocks away from where I live. And I just blurted out like a little kid, have you ever thought of doing another? And she blurted back, oh, I do that in a heartbeat. And that's how I became one of three people who started the second mosaic tile staircase, a four year project that is now four doors away from where I live. I show you these slides of Colette and I'm seeing the applause. This was not to get applause for that. It's to make the point that the library was the meeting place for that. And libraries in our neighborhood became the meeting places we were recruiting volunteers and promoting the project. It was one librarian asking a simple innocuous question. Would you like to meet an artist, a local artist? that led to the second of what are now five or six ceramic tile staircases done by Colette and Aileen here in San Francisco. So when I show you these pictures, it's not just about pretty pictures and it's not just about tying them into storytelling. It's that these are a personal part of my own experiences here in San Francisco and having had the good fortune to be in a city that you think of as being finished and being part of a group, part of a huge group that made a transformation that was positive 
that turn 148 step staircase that leads from the top of the hill down to the bottom of the hill that was becoming dangerous and unpleasant back into a place where not only the neighbors use it and meet and talk and dream together, but people from all over the world come. So now we have the advantage of having people come to our neighborhood and making the neighborhood even more lively. That is what we want to do with the simple innocuous things we do day to day, with the more focused things we do in storytelling as we take our storytelling out to the community and say, what's your pain point? What hurts for you? Oh, that hurts for us too. What can we do together? And honing it into those brief, engaging, motivational, inspirational stories that bring change about for the people we're with. We suggest to you that probably that's a lot to absorb. Uh, I'm hoping it will be a surprise to you that we've been going for almost an hour now. If it felt like an hour, I'm sorry. If it felt like that was about 10 or 15 minutes, yay, we did it. It's the power of us communicating together and collaborating to make a difference. I'm going to pause the recording so that if you want to step away for a few minutes to do whatever you need to do, you can do that. While the recording is paused, I will stay here live. And if you want to have some informal, unrecorded conversation, we'll do that. We'll come back in at the top of the hour and do some quick workshopping. It's going to revolve around you starting to tell the story you want to do. And if we've got time, we'll do a bit of critiquing so that you walk away with something that is your secondary third draft rather than the first. Welcome back after our brief pause. Those of you who are watching the archive version didn't notice a thing. You didn't feel a thing there. Those of us who are in the live version have just had five minutes of behind the scenes spirited conversation about things to go for and how to approach some of the specific things that we're addressing. Our last part of the workshop here is going to be focused on hands-on writing of materials and critiquing it to see where we can get with our stories. There's a book that I've been reading, I'm not even finished with it yet, but it's lovely and I wanna mention it to you as a resource. You'll also find it in the resources listed at the end of the slide deck. So if, if you're seeing this afterwards or if you're part of today's presentation live audience, Karen will be putting the deck out to you after um, the recording is finished. She'll give you a link to the recording as well as to the slide deck. And it'll have this book that I'm about to mention, Will Store, W-I-L-L, -L, his first name, Store, S-T-O-R-R, -R. The book is called The Science of Storytelling, Why Stories Make Us Human and How to Tell Them Better. Now, it's very much a book written for people that are writing fiction, but I find that so far what I've seen in it, it's so compelling in the things that it points out about being how to write stories about characters that are interesting, recognizing the flaws in the characters, which is what makes them interesting, getting us to the dramatic impacts. I think it would be pretty easy for you to translate this book written for writers into a book for those of us who are storytellers for advocacy and adopt some of those things in. So again, The Science of Storytelling, and that is by Will Storr. I'm gonna glance back at chat here. Julie's asking, can you please repeat what you said about not focusing too much on opposition? Yes, quoting Patrick Sweeney or paraphrasing Patrick from the session that we've recorded from last November, 2021 about advocacy for communities. My take on this is you don't wanna spend a lot of time on your opponents. You don't wanna make them the center of your efforts. You wanna focus on those people that are with you. But what Patrick has suggested is if you've got strong opponents out there, an effective way to deal with them can be to have people in your community be the ones that respond rather than you taking the time to respond. If there's a factual thing where you just need to correct somebody, fair enough, that doesn't take a lot of time. But if you're proposing something and somebody is adamantly opposed to it, the less you can do to be drawn into a tit for tat kind of argument with them, and the more you can do to let others take that up for you, the better you are at putting your efforts into the positive side of advocacy and change that allows you to, to use your time effectively. So that's a very brief paraphrase, and I hope it's somewhat accurate to what Patrick was saying. He and John Trasco, Kraska, by the way, have done two books about library advocacy and strongly recommend those. I've got them listed on the CLA Advocacy Tools page which is a great resource for you. You can go and find the books there. And it's a good time for us to pitch that page. If you're an advocate and you wanna find a bunch of resources that will help you in a variety of topics, go to the California Library Association site, follow the link to their advocacy page, and there will be a link there to the advocacy tools. We spent a lot of time last year putting up a variety of resources and we'll continue to update those as time allows. So storytelling and workshopping here. Three storytelling techniques that I'd like you to apply as you talk about your own story here and workshop it. The first is the idea of the quest. We all know about quests. We've seen so many stories, movies, red short stories. 
It's the state of the problem and a solution offered. So if you can frame your story in terms of a quest, here's what we're trying to do, here are the obstacles we're facing, and with your assistance, here's what we can do to make a positive change. You can take that typical storytelling thing and turn it into a tool that works effectively for you. A second approach is the head and heart approach, which is a data-driven story that features emotional impact to suggest the need and response. And that's really good if you're talking at the legislative level or if you're talking to other formal organizations where you're asking for a vote of approval. You want to give them the data to know to show that you know what you're talking about and to document the problem that you're trying to resolve rather than just having them take it as, as a matter of faith that there is a problem. But get back to that emotional story. You know, we've heard some of those in the first part of this. There are plenty of other stories out there. And again, on the California Library Association Advocacy Tools page, we've actually done a series of interviews with advocates in California that talk about the things that they faced and how they went out there. These are all great resources for you. And finally, a third thing is the we're all in this together approach to stories, the personal story that applies to everyone, not just to the storyteller. The huge caveat, which should be obvious to all of you at this point in this workshop, they all have to be audience centric. They all have to be engaging and they all have to be capable of inspiring positive action. That's storytelling for library advocacy. So to review here, you can do your, your workshop story any way you want, but if you're looking for a framework, the quest or the head and heart approach or the we're all in there together, that may give you a starting point. So your mission here over the next few minutes is with whatever tools you want to use, think of a story you want to tell that is going to lead to a positive impact of drawing people into the cause you're, for which you are advocating. Draft that out in about five or six lines, remembering that you want a, a sharp, engaging story up front. You want a little bit of documentation about why it's important and what will happen without it. And then the request for action. Take a few minutes to write those out. And when you're finished, let me know that you're ready. And we'll, we'll go through a few of those very quickly to see what you came up with and see what we can do to improve them. You're on. Any questions? Yeah, I think this is where, again, I'll pause the recording just briefly. And if we get into questions, then I'll, I'll restart the recording for the home audience. Okay, for those of you watching the home recording, that was about five minutes of real time here where people were writing their stories. And now we're going to jump into a couple, do some quick critiques and see what you can do in a brief period of time to get a first draft going and what we can do briefly and quickly to improve a second and possibly even a third draft. So Robin, I understand you've got one ready. If you want to go ahead, please share that out. And let's see where we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, we Santa Cruzans stand for personal choice, learning, individuality, and healthy community. And our library system helps us be all of that. Now our central library is under threat of being placed on hold for two years, creating havoc for all nine other libraries if we let the ODOF initiative pass. Besides that, the library, um, besides that, the library they want to build can only be a shadow of what we've planned and funded through Measure S and partnering with affordable housing. We need your help to keep our community healthy with the library and the housing. Great. Uh, does anybody need to hear that a second time, or do you have a good idea of, of the basic pitch she's made? I've seen people go, well, okay. So initial reactions, anybody, what did you like about what you just heard? I like that you had, it, you had her, your facts and you, you know, you, you had like, um, I'm having trouble now <laughs> coming up with the words, but you had your terms. So that people, you know, you could always go back and reference like whatever the initiative is and, and you had you named things and that's always helpful. Anybody else? What did you like about what Robin just did in a first draft? <laughs> I liked I liked at the end you said what you wanted. Yeah. You wanted people to support your cause. Any other comments that were things that you really liked? Keeping in mind, this was a first draft effort. I know, let's I get to the hard it's part. It's smart to, from an administrative standpoint, it's smart to start with that mission statement. Perfect. Now, if you were rewriting this for second draft, what might you suggest with Robin? What, what was your last phrase there, Robin? Because that is always- We need your help to keep our community healthy with the library and the housing. 
it's if there was some way to make that uh like you mentioned paul the oh i don't remember the term but just you know that nugget at the beginning yeah mm -hmm. i'm i'm with you evelina on that one robin i think that that's a good first draft first line also please read your second line again um, now our central library is under threat of being placed on hold for two years, creating havoc for all, it's probably too strong of words, uh, nine other libraries if we let the ODOF initiative pass. It's probably almost never too strong a word. We react to negative things that make us feel like there's a problem. And for those of us that are problem or solution oriented, it immediately calls us to action and say, oh my gosh, there's a problem. I want to help out on that. I don't think you can underplay that. I like what Evelina said about the last line where you're actually saying, we need your help to do this. And I like the idea of taking your second line. And if it doesn't make it too long a sentence, here in Santa Cruz, we need your help. Without you, we're going to be without a library for two years. Or, you know, the real dramatic thing, there's going to be havoc because we will not be doing what we do. Here's how mm -hmm. you can help. And then you circle back at the very end. After this, we hope that you'll contact us. Let us know what we can do with you. And you can do with us to get us the library that we need to serve this community and keep it great. I'm sorry, I'm getting into make it great. <laughs> it's just so that brings back some kind of things that some of us really don't want to see again. But you get the gist of this that you want yes. to encourage people with a positive call at the beginning and the end, having documented it. Any other observations from other people in the workshop today? Tell me for Robin's benefit, how impressed you were at what she came up with in five minutes or less, anybody. Wow, I think this is something that obviously has been churning in your mind, right? And you've probably talked to other people about it. It's not, that's why I, I was having trouble because I couldn't decide on one, you know, I could say this or that or whatever, but you're focused and um, you're feeling this story. And I can tell that. And that comes back to one of those six points I was making earlier. If it's engaging and it's personal, the audience trusts you. Yeah. yeah. Want to be with you. It's so much better than somebody that's screaming about everything that's wrong and not giving us any kind of an outlet and just adding to divisiveness. Mm -hmm. Monica's put in a wonderful comment here. So professional and classy, Robin. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. How'd that feel to you, Robin, having to write something like that in five minutes or less? Um. I do that a lot, but I, I, what I wanted to do was not fear telling the story that's about the thing that I'm scared of, <laughs> you know, and like there's like sort of fear around it. And, and I, so I felt like putting this out, it wasn't like that pretty story or that like feel good story. And I was wanting to find what is the feel good in it. And, and I, so I was trying to identify our similarities as Santa Cruzans to start from there. So it, it made me try for that. And I know it was, it was just a first draft. That's exactly it. All of us in this live session, all of you watching the archive version, remember, it's just a first draft. It's not the end of the world. Take that pressure off yourself. Understand that even the best writers sometimes will do 5, 10, 20 drafts. I am not that diligent myself. I rarely do 20 drafts. But I'll tell you, even on a blog piece, I write a six or seven uh, paragraph blog piece, which covers a, an issue of interest, I hope, to my colleagues in training, teaching, and learning. And I try you know, I'll bang out the first draft in 30 to 45 minutes, and I'll set it aside a little bit and come back and rework it. And I may spend up to an hour embedding hyperlinks into that so that people can go further if they're curious about it, and then come back on a final time before I post it. So a six or seven paragraph blog piece may extend over an entire workday, but when it's out there, at least I'm proud of it, and I know it, it did what I wanted to do. And that's what we all have to keep in mind. Give it the time it needs, and don't fret if it takes longer than it seems it should have taken. There should be no, it should have taken this amount of time. The real thing is, did it produce the results you wanted? And if so, how do you do it again? And if not, what do I do next time so that it's better? Mm -hmm. Wonderful, Robin. Anybody else want to go with the story? Nobody else? I wish I had one. <laughs> no, we're all looking at you now. All right, I got a quick one. All I right. Um, worked in fundraising in the past. So I think what's my ask first, and then I go backwards, right? So we were at a event a couple weeks ago when one of the libraries that got reconstructed because of 
um, government and fabulous donor funding rebuilt. And at that celebration, I said to a few people, did you see the last newsletter? And so my ask was, you should be either signed up for or reading our newsletters when they come into your inbox, because that's going to build the warmth. And then when the ask comes, right. And so everybody I was talking to holding their iced tea was like, no, no, I don't read the newsletters. I said, you didn't see the picture. And there was a picture of a father and a daughter standing in front of the library in front of a banner of that same father and daughter when she was five and now she's off to college 18 and I said there wasn't a dry eye in the audience you know when they laughed and I think it was a really powerful way to say we're all so email inundated this could be a bright spot if you just roll through looking at pictures you know hold that line this can be a bright spot if you look at pictures that's a real gem well worth working with now let's back into the emotional side of this the how how long a time period was there between the original picture in the background and the day that this? I mean, she was a chubby cheeked little sitting at story time with the dad standing behind her. She might have been five. And then the picture was her leaving for college. So say 18. Yeah. So again, I'm just doing this off the top of my head with a, a lousy first draft, but something that it's, to me feels like it's workable here is an opening line that says something about our library is such a part of families that returning after 15 years to our library and remembering what it's meant can bring tears to your eyes. Yeah. And then you work around to saying, we document these kind of things in our newsletter. We want stories, we want your stories, so share them with you. And we want you to be part of this. So we hope you'll subscribe to the newsletter and share it with others so that we continue making the library a part of our community that makes the community grow in positive ways. Now that's a really lousy first draft, but at least- It's not lousy. The use of the word returning is great, especially after two years of shelter in place, you know, in California. So I think returning is a key word right now. Uh, more brilliant than I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> and again, this is the thing that makes workshopping and collaboration so important to all of us. When I blow that off the top of my head and say, I think it's a lousy first draft and you're pulling out something that for you is a gem, and this is where we are stronger together. And this is why we have to keep doing these things together. I think that's the heart of advocacy. It's collaboration. It's growing with each other. It's setting our egos aside and not having to say, this was my story and I'm going to tell it this way. One of the first things we learn as professional writers is the thing that what Annie Lamott calls those little darlings, those little gems that are our favorite lines, those we throw out first. The second thing is we listen to, to constructive criticism. It's given it to our work as a gift rather than a painful thing. Mm. Somebody cares enough about us to say, I think it might work better this way. You listen to it and if it's great, you grab it. If you don't agree, you can always set it aside because ultimately you're gonna be responsible for it. And I've seen Monica say, oh my God, it's 1130. I'm hoping they've got another five minutes because my clock is still showing 1125. Mm -hmm. But um, in Monica's thank you, you're welcome. Robin's saying such a great piece in the sequence, Monica. I would totally agree with that. And I think that as we're getting down to it, let me ask, was there anybody else who wanted to respond to the story you just heard? I had a question more than, yes. a, I guess that's a response, but um, so you have, that's a great, Robin has this basic framework, this story. Do you find that if, depending on your audience, you're going to switch it around a little bit? Like, let's say you were speaking to because this is a voting issue, right, Robin? So first time voters, young people, college, you know, maybe that whole idea of the quest, you know, something like that is going to capture their imagination, something a little more whimsical. Do you, is that something that um, we do, Paul? <laughs> I change on the, on the turn of the dime, you know, okay. the pandemic, which was very, has been very painful for many people and for very justifiable reasons has been painful for me too, but it's been a time of opportunities because it's made me re-examine things I do. And it's made me better for the people that I, that I serve as a consultant, as well as a storyteller and a writer. So yeah, I pivot on the turn of a dime. Mm -hmm. On a good day, which happens about once every 10 years, I'll have my slide decks done two or three weeks in advance. I'll have all my speaker notes done. Typical thing is I'll finish them a few days ahead of time. And I may, like I was doing this morning, Karen knows this about, 20 minutes before the presentation, I realized as I was doing the background for this, which is a standard background where I just need to change the date and the title, I realized I hadn't done that for this session. So I went back into my template, changed it that one. Oh my gosh, I just realized 
I had last month's session title <laughs> on the slide deck at the first Ursula Meyer slide. Oh. So I'm up to the last minute if I've got the luxury of doing it, changing. And in fact, in storytelling, same deal. Those of you who arrived early realize I let you in a few minutes early so we can just chat and I can get a sense of what you really needed. I think this is important and people lose that when they think about online versus face-to-face -face on site. You can create that same sense of engagement online as on site. And in fact, you should try for that just by doing the things you would do online, on site, when you're online. Have those informal conversations. Take those breaks. Don't worry. So many of my colleagues worry. Uh, <laughs> if you give people a break halfway through, they're not going to come back. It's like, if giving them a break means they're not going to come back, you were doing it all wrong. I never <laughs> worry about that. And we will notice anybody watching the archive version notices that we have a smaller group now than we had at the beginning. That wasn't because we had a break. There were people letting me know throughout that they had other meetings to go to. And as storytellers and presenters and advocates, we don't worry about who stays and who goes unless we're alone in the room at the end of what we've been doing. We just care about what is accomplished in the time we have together. And whether we're talking to one person, 10 people or a thousand people, we're not rock stars. We're out there trying to make change. And sometimes it's person by person, step by step. Sometimes it's with much larger groups of people, but we do it because we care. We do it because it's important to us. Any other questions or observations? Let me do one last screen share here of the deck because I want to do a summary here that makes a point I made earlier to you about the importance of having visuals that tie into your conversation and become memory anchors for you as you are setting up the learning process for people. So let's get this in slideshow mode. Okay, so I'm telegraphing what I'm about to do. The summary here is not a bunch of bullet points. The summary is reviewing the points that I hope will stick with you and tying them back to the images we had in the hope and the belief that saying the words and having the image there will make it more memorable to you than otherwise would have been the case. So we started off with the idea of telling stories that draw back enough to give the context and not having stuff so specific that the listener gets lost in what you're doing. We talked about the need to have something that's inviting and makes us want to go with us up the path of that story. We talked about the importance of honing in on the particulars and making it engaging. I did not have this slide, and I think that was a mistake in my final prep of the deck. There should have been a slide that shows you the hidden garden steps that I talked about, the one just four steps away from me. This is the detail of that one where I was making it personal to make the point to you, make your stories personal and appropriate so people know that it's meaningful to you. And finally, remember that storytelling, whether it's for advocacy or any other thing, has to have that sense of grace, that sense of flight, that sense of lovely fleeting thing that stays with you at some memorable level so that people walk away transformed, excited, and they want to join you. So let's get that off the screen. Got just one more minute. The question I always ask, and I'm going to ask you to please play with me on this one. What is one thing you will do differently in the next week as a result of having spent time together in this session? Anybody? If you're watching the archive version, freeze this long enough for you to, to jot down your own answer. What's the one thing you're going to do so it becomes your action plan and makes this meaningful? I see Diane say, design a hook to begin my stories. It's wonderful. I think I'm going to talk to some of my, I work in literacy also, talk to some of my team and find out what, what, what stories do you want, do we want to tell? and just come up with something because I haven't done that yet. Remember that takes the pressure off you. Yeah. You're actually having people as your co-conspirators be yes. part of the process of identifying the stories, telling the stories saying, that's my story too. And I'm gonna go out and make a difference. Yeah. Thank you, it's wonderful. Thank Anyone you. else? I'm going to tell the story with refinements that I told that I wouldn't have necessarily told prior to coming here. That is lovely. And remember, we never stop. I may tell the same story a dozen times, and there's always some different hook on it based on the audience I saw. There was a question I'm not sure I directly answered a couple minutes ago. Do I change my stories? Yeah. Do I change my slide decks? Yeah. I look at the audience, I find out what's interesting to them, and I think, what can I do that makes this more important to them? It's not about me being a good or a great storyteller. It's about me motivating them to get to the results we all want. Anyone else with what you'll do differently? But I think that unfortunately for us, but maybe fortunately for you, takes us to the end of our 90 minutes together. 
Thank you for being such great co-conspirators and making this such an easy, lovely session. I love the stories you told. I love the inspiration you bring. I hope that makes a difference to the people that you serve. I hope you join us again next month and in future months for the second Wednesday of the month, Ursula Meyer training series, as we continue bringing you the best people we can bring to talk about issues of advocacy to help you and the communities we serve be better. See you next month. <laughs>